So you can either, you can either sit, stand here, or sit there, or we can have. I like to. Lectern's easy, but we have some ridiculous short. I need. And, okay, and um, I fear that we're not going to see. I emailed the slides. Yes, and you also have your iPhone. Right. Okay. There are a couple of there's the. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. So people are joining in. Julie Papworth, I see you're there. Could you tell us in the chat whether you can see us? I don't think you can. I'm assuming you can hear us. Chat, chat, chat. <laughs> no, can't see you, but can hear us. Right. Then let's try some different cameras. That's just come on. So that should be. Working. How could that possibly be? Um, Everybody online, we are we are planning to start um, right away. I'm trying to improvise a way for you to see this. Um, Camera of my own, you see, so I was hoping that to pick that up. It doesn't do it here. Then we will have to cut our looks. It's the top one, right? The presentation. Right, right. You're getting there, I think. Um. Oh, you are screwed here. Oh. 
Right. This is worse, uh, worse than the usual. Um, if I had an excuse, it would be it would be that I am uh, I've just stepped off a plane from another time zone. <laughs> So, um, how could this possibly be happening? Right. So, there, there. right. Well, I think I think they can hear us, but they can't uh, see us. The screen is now visible. Yes. So the PowerPoint screen is now visible. Uh, we're told by Joshua Down. So we can use this um, um, slideshow from the, from the from the beginning, um, and then we'll have to rely on rely on this. I'm going to have to start uh, uh, welcoming uh, people. <clears throat> Welcome, uh, everybody, to, uh, to tonight's uh, British Maritime History, King's uh, Maritime History Seminar. Uh, you all know you're in the Department of War Studies here at King's and the Lawton Naval History Unit. I think some of you know that you're also being hosted by the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War. Uh, we're indebted to uh, Lloyd's Register. Uh, and various uh, others. And I am delighted uh, tonight because we have a speaker who came to us uh, very highly recommended. So we have Lee Kopak, who is a journalist and a journalist who has specialized in insurance uh, and risk, uh, that sort of thing. Spent seven years as the insurance correspondent at uh, Lloyd's List and, and three years in a communications <coughs> role with the UK uh, P&I Club. Now she's the author of a book, uh, Merchants, Mariners, and Mavericks, Lloyd's Agents for the First 200 uh, Years. And uh, Lee received an MA in the History of Medicine in 2018 from Birkbeck, and is now the facilitator of the History Fellows at the Society of Apothecaries. Uh, we know uh, we know them well, actually, indirectly. So there is uh, no one better uh, to to welcome back to this uh, final term or this final uh, uh, set of, of, of lectures, and no one better to talk to us about the Woody Island disaster, which is why uh, uh, Lee is here. So it's with our thanks that I hand over to you. It's with apologies to people online that they can't uh, see you. Uh, if I dare, I might uh, try to meddle while you speak, but I probably won't. <laughs> so it's with thanks that I hand over to you, and this will function uh, as normal. Uh, should I do with that? Or oh, I can, if you like. Oh, or wave at it, because I'm going bit. OK, you can wave. Uh, okay. wave. Do the next slide, please. So um, thank you all very much. I feel a slight interloper from the medical historians. But as Alan says, I have spent some time dealing with things maritime, and um, Julie Patworth encouraged me to come and talk to you. So um, this was a, a tragedy, a, a casualty that, that really um, sticks in my mind. I joined Lloyd's List in 1978 in late November. And on the 6th of January, 1979, the 121,000 deadweight tons tank of Betelgeus had competed berthing at the offshore jetty about 400 meters off Whitty Island, Bantry Bay, County Cork, in the southwest of Ireland. On the 8th of January, shortly after midnight, fire enveloped a large section of the ship and the offshore jetty. There are a number of explosions and then an enormous one. The crew of the tanker, the wife of one crew member, two visitors to the tanker, the crew on the jetty, and the ship's pilot, 50 people in all, died. <coughs> the vessel broke into three, and there was extensive damage to the jetty and its installations. Tanker explosions were nothing new, but this was exceptional. 
It didn't involve a vessel under a flag of convenience in a remote country, or indeed what one of the underwriters used to call a crew of convenience. It was in Ireland. The owner of the battleships was the French oil major Total. The jetty and terminal where the oil was discharged were owned and operated by Gulf Oil Ireland. All the victims were French, Irish, or British. The official inquiry that followed laid the major share of responsibility for the loss of the ship on Total. But the tribunal also castigated the Gulf, the decisions and actions that led to the deaths. There was no rescue from the beginning of the fire at midnight 30 to the ultimate <coughs> explosion at five past one. Only 27 bodies were ever recovered. Within a few months, sufficient flag states had ratified the 1974 International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, or SOLAS 1974, and it came into force a year later on 25 May 1980. This didn't stop tanker explosions because there were still many older tankers trading without the safety measures required under SOLAS, but change was underway. Today, there are still issues unresolved in Ireland. Even now, more than 40 years later, anger remains among the families of the victims and others who were affected, like the firemen. They blamed failures by the Irish government to enforce safety regulations at Woody Island. They say there was no focus in the subsequent official inquiry into these domestic regulatory failures and say that the state has failed to establish independent investigative procedures for maritime accidents. So that's what it looked like a day later. They continue to call for a formal state apology and to change the death certificates to unlawful death under the right to life provisions of Article 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights. At the time of the explosion, I was the insurance correspondent of Lloyd's List. I didn't write the initial stories, but followed the later developments. So in addition, <coughs> To the various sources I'll just describe, I've added some comments from my memory to the extent that I can uh, stand them up. So there is the headline from the Irish Times. Those are the headings that I'm going to use. A significant primary source is the report of the official tribunal by the Irish Parliament, published on the 25th of July 1980. I've consulted Lloyd's List for its casualty reports, and frustratingly, as you probably know, Lloyd's List of this immediate period is neither digitized nor indexed, so I haven't been able to search as assiduously as I would have liked. Neither, of the, neither are the annual reports of Gulf or Total easily available in this country at least. For some comments, I refer to a paper called The Strange History of Tanking Outing by Jack Devaney of the Center for Tank Ship Excellence in Florida. The center was basically Devaney with all the limitations that implies. I haven't been able to contact him, but he did have a strong background in marine engineering, academia, and tankers. What he says about the slow process of gas in tankers reinforces my memory of the period, and another industry <coughs> commentator wrote similarly. Another important source is Michael Kingston. Michael is a maritime lawyer and also the son of one of the victims of the explosion. His father died when he was four. Michael has continued to campaign to reforms by the Irish government in its accident investigation processes, repeatedly stating that the Irish government has not learned the lessons of history. Michael currently works as a consultant with the International Maritime Organization, and he's commented on this presentation. He's currently attending the Maritime Safety Committee meeting of IMO in London. So I thought about the historical framework and 
I do think how one might look at it in a broader historical context. It seems to me that the loss of the battleships illustrates the slow speed of change in the maritime industry, even when there is clear evidence of a need and possible advantage. It's, it's a long time since the risks of ensuring sea transport could be reasonably described in the language of the 18th century as the adventures and the perils of a voyage to be insured. This phrase from the 1779 Lloyd's Hall form remained in use until 1978. <coughs> I'm not, I hope you can see that. Um, the economics of shipping are clearly the major fact, major influence, especially when few members of the public <coughs> are among victims of an event. We also see inertia by the government of Ireland in dealing with its maritime regulatory and enforcement processes and maritime investigation for no reasons that I've been able to find out. And Michael Kingston could not give me any reason other than inertia. Finally, I'd add from the experience of researching this case, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, that a historian should be concerned about the reasonable availability of documents for future research. Specialist libraries might be cared at the National Maritime Museum or under financial pressure and may not be able to maintain holdings or subscribe to the valuable digital services that we'd be looking for. <coughs> So turning to the inquiry, you, I hope you can see, but it was the day following the explosion. The Irish Minister for Transport and Tourism appointed a surveyor in his department to carry out an inquiry into the casualty. At the same time, an inspector was appointed by the Minister for Labour to inquire into the disaster. And it was also announced that a public inquiry would be held in the form of a tribunal inquiry. And that's the report that I've referred to. The first public sitting of the tribunal took place on the 6th of April, 1979. It heard evidence for 65 days, took evident oral evidence for oral submission for further six days. There were 184 witnesses who gave technical and expert testimony and evidence of the facts. On the 25th of July, 1980, the Irish Parliament published the report. It is 508 pages and makes 45 recommendations. Do we have the cover of the report please that should show? Let's see. Yes, there we are. It found some good practices between Total and Gulf, but much more strongly reported that there had been short-term economies on maintenance and upgrading, poor processes or failures to maintain good processes negligence and sometimes gross negligence compounded by attempts to conceal or shift blame. The tribunal found that the major responsibility for the loss of the ship lay with the management of Total. It also revealed many factors under the control of Gulf that magnified its impact and resulted in the deaths on the ship and the jetty. I'll just read you a little bit. I was going to put it on the screen, but it's a bit dense. The report said the initiating event of the disaster was the buckling of the ship's structure at or about deck level and in the way of the permanent ballast tanks forward of the ship's manifold. This was immediately followed by explosions in the permanent ballast tanks and the breaking of the ship's back. These events were produced by the conjunction of two separate factors, a seriously weakened hull due to inadequate maintenance and an excessive stress due to incorrect ballasting on the night of the disaster. The report concluded, had the vessel been properly maintained, it is probable that the structure of the vessel would not have failed. Added to this, the tribunal highlighted the absence of two pieces of equipment that would have substantially reduced the risk of explosion. One was a lodicator, and the other was an inert gas system. The report noted that it was virtually standard practice for large tankers, at that, even at that date, to have an electronic component 
known as a lodicator, or a mechanical means for calculating stresses during the loading and discharge. The Bettelschutz did not. I'll say a bit more about inert gas systems shortly. According to Lloyd's List, two days after the disaster, Bill Finnegan, chairman of Gulf Oil Turnips in Ireland, appeared at a press conference <coughs> in Bantry Bay and put the responsibility for the explosion of fire onto the ship. However, as I said, the report of the tribunal did not examine Gulf Oil for previous decisions, failures on the night, and even active steps to conceal evidence. These conclusions appear in a chapter of the report headed Suppression of the Truth. This official report of the Bellingshire's explosion is a catalog of failures that will be familiar to those of you who have read or perhaps even been involved in other inquiries into shipping and industrial disasters. It made me think of the Swiss cheese model of accident causation put forward by Professor James Reason of the University of Manchester. He described an organization's defenses against failure as a series of barriers lined up like slices of Swiss cheese, but with holes like Swiss cheese that represent weaknesses in parts of the system. In his book, Human Error, published in 1991, Reason argued that accidents occur when these weaknesses coincide, like having the holes in the Swiss cheese all lined up. I don't know if this model of failure analysis has been used to examine historic maritime and naval disasters and near misses, but it strikes me as having a considerable potential, if not. That was once the fire was out, you can see the damage on the jetty as well as the section of the ship. Dutch Salvas Smith Tack arrived in Bantry Bay with a survey team the day of the casualty. Total, the liability insurers, and the Irish authorities wanted the remaining crude oil in the hull and the wreck removed as quickly as possible. But it took many months to pump out the oil and shift the three section of the hull. At that time, the Belgians was the largest ever salvage operation. Well, of course, it's been overtaken since, I suspect, by the cost of Concordia, if not a number of others. Like most salvage people, the class Reinegert, who oversaw the process, um, who I managed to speak to, is, is phlegmatic. Yes, he says it was the largest ever to date, but it was not that exceptional. <laughs> well, you may feel differently if you watch the fascinating film Smith made of the whole process. It's available on YouTube and I can supply the links. So turning to the background, tanker explosions were not new in 1987. They were, in fact, the most frequent kind of non-war tanker casualty, according to Jack Devaney, who I mentioned. He recounts that, at least in the United States, the first known conversion of a wooden sailing ship to carry oil involved was the Charles in 1869. She was fitted with 59 separate tanks. Three years later, the Charles caught fire and was lost. The hydrocarbons carried by tankers produce volatile vapors, if the oxygen level in the air in the tank, in the orange, is above 10% or during the discharge, the mixture becomes combustible. Normal air contains about 21% oxygen. An ignition, ignition source, such as the cracking of metal plates, triggers, can trigger an explosion. At its simplest, the process of inerting the tanks consists of diverting a portion of boiler exhaust gas to a scrubber which is little more than a large shell, which pulls the gas and it uh, extracts this from sulfur. Then the combined combusted low oxygen gas, the combusted low oxygen gas is pumped into the cargo tanks. If the system is properly maintained and operated, and that in early days was not necessarily the case, the oxygen content in the tank atmosphere will be less than 5%. It will not support combustion regardless of the amount of hydrocarbon in the, gap, in the tank. In 1932, and this goes back um, to the United States, a series of explosions took place in a sunk oil tanker in the Delaware River. 
Some oil knew they could make tank as much safer by melting the cargo tanks. The technology was always in use in refiner or in use in refiner refineries, and they believed could be adapted. By the end of 1933, all sun oil tankers were fitted with inert gas systems, and the company credited inerting for saving many lives on its ships during World War II. Sun Oil also realized that proper inerting dramatically reduces steel corrosion rates in the cargo tanks. This was not only an important economic saving, but also another big safety and environmental benefit because tank corrosion can easily result in cargo leaking into ballast tanks or pump rooms where it becomes a major hazard. Amazingly, commented Jack Devaney, neither tanker owners nor tanker regulators seem to take any apparent notice of some success with inerting for nearly 30 years. After World War II, tanker explosions continued. The 26,972 deadweight tons turned back to Japan was almost certainly tank cleaning when she blew up in the Arabian Sea in October 1958. The explosion ripped the deck off almost all the center tanks and tossed the midship's house into the sea. At least 19 people were killed, including everyone on the bridge. In 1956, the Suez crisis had triggered the demand for much larger tankers to carry crude oil from the Middle East to refineries worldwide. The 1960s brought even bigger ships, enter into service what became known as very large crude carriers or VLCCs with deadweight tons of 200,000 or more. Three such vessels suffered enormous cargo tank explosions while tank cleaning after the cargo had been delivered within a three week period in December 1969. Still no regretting. In 1974, the United States Coast Guard acted. It required tank inerting, although only on crude tankers above 100,000 deadweight tons and built after 1974, so not to most on store the ships in service. And the regulation only applied to ships trading to the United States. The battleships was already 11 years old in 1979. She did not trade to the United States. So she wasn't under pressure from that Coast Guard regulation. The inquiry report indicates that Total wanted to sell her. According to the Lawrence List article, Louis Bourzol, president of Total Oil and the ultimate owner of the ship, also attended the press conference immediately after the disaster. And he commented that IGS, in a gas systems, had not been standard equipment in 1978 when the battleships was built. Although, as we've seen, Sun Oil had them for much earlier. Jack Devaney asked the obvious question, why was the industry so slow to adopt an obvious, effective safety measure, which probably pays for itself in the reduction of climate? His cynical view was that with few notable exceptions, tanker owners did not see it in their interest. Certainly not to retrofit older tankers with low hull values. Nor, as I remember, was there a great insurance incentive. Hull insurance premiums were competitive. The insured value could be more than a second-hand uh, market value. I certainly remember hearing such conversations in the insurance market at the time. SOLAS 1974 sets minimum standards for the construction and equipment of ships compatible with their safety. The flag states are responsible for ensuring ships under their flag comply with those requirements. The new version of SOLAS 1974 had been adopted on the 1st of November 1974, and it included measures for minimizing the possibility of ignition of flammable cargo vapor, including requiring inert gas systems. At the time of the battleship's disaster, 1979, however, it had not received enough signatories to enter into force. 
That changed within a few months. By 25 May 1979, the minimum number of countries and time should ratify CELIS 1974, and it came into force 12 months later. Initially, the CELIS requirement for inert gas systems applied to tanks over 100,000 dead weight, but the threshold was reduced to 20,000 tons dead weight the following year. However, this was a period of significant tanker casualties because much of the tanker fleet was aging and many ships were either not inert or without good inert systems. For instance, and these are two I remember, one I remember very well, two very large combination oil bulk ore carriers belonging to the Norwegian company Bergesen disappeared within four years of each other, one in 1975 and one in 1979 with the loss of 70 lives. Both are believed to have suffered catastrophic explosions due to problems with an earth gas system. I believe that it was the second ship, the Bergevanger, that Lloyds rang the routine bell for an overdue ship for the last time. In the early 1980s, there were three major tank cleaning explosions on VLCCs within a few weeks of each other the Maria Alejandra, the Albaha B, and the Mycenae. By contrast, when the energy concentration broke about discharging in Rotterdam in 1980, the inert gas system worked. She was a total loss in insurance terms, but there was no explosion. Well, this is something of a diversion. I'd like to remember two other casualties from the period that I remember, and some of you may remember as well. One is the Derbyshire, another combination carrier that was lost on the 9th of September 1980, south of Japan in Typhoon Orchid. All aboard her, which was 42 crew and two spouses died. At 91,655 gross tons, she was and remains the largest UK ship to have been lost at sea, I believe. The wreckage was only located in 1994. It turned out that the consequences of damage by storm waves to the ventilation pipes were blamed for the ship's loss. Another tank loss was one of the most fascinating stories I worked on on Lloyd's list. Lloyd's first thought that the reported loss of the tank of Salem on the coast of Senegal on the 17th of January 1980 was yet another tank of disaster in a horrible period. Underwriters became suspicious quite quickly, however. The ship was supposed to be fully laden with crude oil for Genoa, which was unlikely to explode. The weather was good, and apparently the crew had the bags and pack lunches ready when picked up by another tanker, which was conveniently in the vicinity. This was at a time uh, of oil sanctions against the apartheid regime in South Africa, and it soon emerged that the crew had secretly offloaded the cargo of 192,000 tons of crude oil in Durban before attempting to conceal the evidence by scuttling the ship. The insurance claims which followed went all the way to the House of Lords, and I enjoyed reporting them. So returning finally to the battle shows. As far as I can find out, total insurance claims for the battleships amounted to $120 million. This would have included the hull and the lost cargo. The owners of the jetty and terminal would reached an out of court settlement with the French owners of the vessel for their damages. And as usual, a PI club ensured the ship owners' liabilities. In this case, it was the West of England PI club, and it paid for the oil pollution response costs and the removal of the wreck. The ship's crew were covered by the French Merchant Marine Scheme. In addition, there were out of court settlements to the families of the other men who died. There were no trials for manslaughter or gross negligence related to the disaster, nor convictions for any offences. In France and Ireland, this is not the end of the story. More than 43 years later, the families of the victims do not feel the Irish government has dealt with the issues properly an argument articulated clearly and frequently by Michael Kingston. And there you see the memorial service for the 40th anniversary on the island and the memorial that was put up. 
As recently as July 2020, the European Court of Justice found against Ireland in a case brought by the European Commission. The court said Ireland had failed to create an investigative body for maritime transport accidents that was independent in its organization and decision making of any party whose interest could conflict with a trust invested, entrusted to the investigative body. And that was because officials from the Department of Transport served on the Maritime, Maritime Casualty Investigation Board. They resigned, two of them resigned after the judgment. In January 2021, during pre-legislative scrutiny of the legislation that had to be enacted following the judgment, Michael Kingston presented a new report by maritime consultant Maureen Hazard that highlighted fundamental and repeated failings of Ireland's maritime investigation system. He says that a number of Irish politicians have now called for a public inquiry. In September 2021, the Irish te television and radio network RTE produced Fire in the Sky, which you can watch. It's a vivid account of what happened that night, mainly from eyewitnesses or family members. It also includes criticisms of the Irish government by former president of Ireland, Mary McLeese, a barrister who was working for RTE as a journalist and presenter in 1979. Parliamentary debate followed the airing of the program. Deputy Hildegard Norton, Minister of State, the Department of Transport, responded to criticisms and argued that the government had updated its strategy for the Irish Maritime Directorate. She said work was continuing to amend legislation and consider the organizational structures in marine casualty investigation. However, Michael Kingston and the French Irish Association of the Friends and Family of the Battlegers say the government has still not proposed the fundamental changes required. He told me yesterday by email that he's actively preparing a formal request to the Attorney General of Ireland to direct a new inquest into the deaths. They say the victims of the disaster died unlawfully due to safety breaches and a failure by the state to ensure safe operations. They argue that as such, the original coroner's verdicts did not consider the surrounding circumstances of the deaths, which is a fundamental right under the European Convention on Human Rights. They may also include a simultaneous application for judicial review. So the noise of the original explosion was heard partway across Ireland, and it continues to reverberate across the country. Thank you very much. Pressing you long ago as well, so um, we would hope that uh, more progress and so forth. So I'm going to invite everybody now to ask uh, questions. I'm going to see if there are any online, and there is. So Louise um, Sanger uh, has asked you. Uh, fascinating research presentation. Um, it's thanking you for your important work. Have you studied any other disasters in the same way, to the same uh, extent? Not recently. I remember working, um, perhaps not with the same depth, on the Texas City um, explosion, refinery explosion. And that was one of the reasons, and, and also moving things like the Herald of Free Enterprise. Um, and um, there's another one where there was concealment. Um, these, these inquiries so often seem to involve familiar things, don't they? It's, you know, there, there are weaknesses, and the weaknesses are compounded, and then often by attempts to shift blame, to find evidence, or at least not to bring it forward. So that's certainly the case, and I suspect, I mean, um, Michael Kingston talks about Hillsborough, and I think we had a number of cases where, with Hillsborough, if I remember correctly, where evidence was, was not correct. Wasn't that the case? Well, at Hillsborough, no. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know the details now, but yes, it's a I mess. Know. Yes. <clears throat> um, I don't know whether any of you have taken part in any of these. 
like inquiries? Yes, I, I have, in fact, a number of them. So, I mean, a fascinating presentation. Tim Carter with NCA for a while, also with the health and safety executive in Holland. Uh, it poses so many questions still. I, one of the practical issues is small maritime states have very limited competence in terms of investigative bodies. Yeah. United States, UK, France, Norway, for instance, have very good maritime investigation bodies who are professional about it. Somewhere like Ireland, and it's similar with the Bahamas and lots of the other uh, places of convenience, they've got no capability. And they often call on classification societies to assist with investigations. They're one thing you have to mention, which is quite an important feature. Who are both a pillar of conservatism in the maritime industry, but can also be innovative. Um, my real question here is you were de you're dealing with three different jurisdictions. You're dealing with the Irish one, presumably it's a French flag. Yes, it is. So you're dealing with a French one who actually have very competent axiom yeah. investigation. And you also deal with an American oil company yes. as the operators of the jetters. Did those other jurisdictions play a part in the investigation? I can see why I would be reluctant to ask the UK maritime investigation branch to look at this, but did they call in good external expertise? And did the other, other jurisdictions play a part in actively investigating this? They certainly did call in external expertise, much of which was from the UK. Um, and, you know, I did think um, at lo of looking at the must have been French inquiry because that was a flag state. Um, but it's like pulling a piece of thread and thought, it's, it just keeps going and we never come to the end. But I'm sure there was a French investigation. I didn't really see anything in the States. What I wanted to do was to see what Total and Gulf Oil had put in their annual reports at the time, but I wasn't able to get those reports in London or easily in the UK. Um, turning to the class societies, certainly Jack Devaney was quite critical of them because he said, as well as the five states, that they depend on attracting ship owners. Um, it was Bureau Veritas, by the way, for Batches. They depend on attracting ship owners, and so they're in a somewhat invidious position um, when it comes to some of their work. Please. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I was a prescriptive health of which the Irish East at the time was. It's a huge. Uh, huge media stuff. Yeah. But what you haven't mentioned is it shouldn't have been there in the first place because it was originally meant to have built in Portugal. Yeah. Although yeah. you put that up there, it's very difficult to see. Uh, the other thing is uh, at the time, it's 42 French people died, seven Irish, yeah. one Brit, that was a 50 dead. But only 27 boys were recovered yes. simply because most of them were incinerated in the vapor exploded. Mm -hmm. And those are the actual jet of itself, which was a huge thing, yeah. well out of into the bay, but just blown off it. Yeah. But when you're talking about uh, and so last, et cetera. Etc. Etc. Et That's when double bottoms started for them on ships. Right? The older ships were given about 15 years of leave. Yeah. Like right? Simply because no one could agree to the pitch. But that's typical of ship owners. My opinion, I would. They're the worst of the worst, yeah. As are most of the developing countries who so become a full and flag in the United States, which they basically just didn't care. But the whole point of using Hume 
European human rights legislation to call for the climate as all ex post facto. Because Ireland was in the EU at the time. No. no she didn't. Subsequently, where? So I don't see how they could actually do that. <laughs> no. And uh, your comments. Well, that's, this, you know, I rely on what Michael Kingston told me. I mean, he was with Clyde Co. He's a maritime lawyer. Um, so he has been pursuing it for 40, well, not quite 40 years, because he lived before it. But he pursued it for the next four years. But going back to your point about the double blotters, and I'm, I'm not sure I can be very specific, but I certainly remember, um, I mean, we had, We've had Exxon um, Amicus Dicks just before this. Um, you know, I thought about including the whole issue of pollution, but you know that was that was too much. We had Exxon. We had um, Amicus Dicks. We had Exxon Valdez. We had the Haven. Um, we had a number of tankers, and again, as, as you say, the same resistance yeah. to um, the double bottoms. I think it was. I remember, and this was after I left, was this. Um, it was the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 in the United States that again forced um, the adoption of double policy. But again, there, there are always um, these, you know, they don't seem to be able to compel retrofitting. And that was certainly the case with the, with the um, net gas systems. Yeah, what do you think? So it's most people are going to fly the companies, especially the Greeks. Um, some of the Norwegians will be able to. Yes. I, I had some dealings with the Liberians, yeah. with the Liberian accident investigation people, and they admired um, British um, experts, ex masters. They were quite conscientious. They had headquarters in Western Virginia, and I used to deal with them, and they were. You know, they were quite conscientious, the Albanians. I think they were the biggest flag at the time, or certainly the biggest um, flag of convenience. They used to call it the time of the fleets. The way of yeah. Honduras, yeah. like here, like that time. Yeah. But the, the underwriters' other concern was what, they, as I said, they called the cruise of convenience yeah. because they were very critical of the, you know, they'd say you can have a perfectly good ship under a flag of convenience. But if it's operated by a poorly trained or poorly, you know. Yeah, I really want to see that with P and O at the I rest my case. <laughs> they will do anything to go to the bottom line. Ship owners always do that stuff. The bottom line is the main thing. Safety, well, we're forgetting mm -hmm. that too. Until yeah, well, there's a comment, uh, I think, uh, following in on this. Ireland joined the EU in 1973. Now, also, as pointed out, the European Convention of Human Rights is a, is a world convention uh, over and above the EU, uh, albeit shine, enshrined in the fundamental charter of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the EU. So there might be, no? No, no. It, it, it's about 40 uh, European, not worldwide, and it was found in the 1949 the ECHR. Okay. So it predates um, both the creation of the original uh, common market and uh, the British and Irish joint membership in the 19th century. Okay, okay. Um, so, it, you know, what, but it wasn't really about, as I understand what you said, but it was the ECHR decision that was concerning for the um, capacity of the court in Ireland to have two memberships. It was it was the European Court of Justice judgment. No, it can't be the European Court of Justice judgment in the European Union. This was this was in 2020. Oh, 2020. Yeah. I'm sorry. The European yes. the European Court of Justice case yeah. related to um, the structure oh. of the maritime accident investigations, yeah. which included people from the Department of Transport, yes. and so the court said this is not. According to European law, capable of um, an well, independent judgment. The, the ECHR's judgment actually, they gave exactly the same decision or rationale, uh, which caused the uh, Supreme Court to be moved down the road and out of the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. That's true. 
And of course, the, the UK, and I would have to remind me, I, I read it, but I can't remember the data, because the UK set up its totally independent real accident investigation branch after the Howard of Free Enterprise, which I think was 86, which is completely interesting. Yeah, it was after this. Um, but Michael Kingston says that that's what I am should call it. Before that, you know, was our court of trade. Yeah. I think there's a little difficulty of how you can get independence and competence together because the people, I mean, there's this concept of spectral capture. But if you have people from a different sector who have the expertise, they have the mindset of that sector. Mm. And it's something I have a lot to do with the HSC, where again, those in spectra, like agriculture, railways, nuclear, I'm not sure, have had people from those sectors in there. And the colour they quite about fibre album yeah. is very much about the need to detach. But it's, it's a very legalistic fiction if you can detach it. So you still need people who understand the industry, but understand it without being captured by sectional interests. And that, I think, is again. You can criticize the Irish Department of Transport. They probably didn't have anybody else yeah. in Ireland with that sort of expertise. And they probably only had two or three people who had that expertise in the Department of Transport. I mean, even as a journalist, as a trade journalist, I was got slightly worried about going native. Because you're working with people all the time, you understand what their concerns are. Um, it's, it, and if you if you also say um, a consultant, you're going to get hired by people. You're going to be working with them. It's and then you just have personal relationships. Well, I remember very well just a land race when the when, when the tunnel collapsed at Heathrow on the express. Everybody was bidding for the ten or twelve people with tunneling expertise in the UK to act as their um, experts and Arab and all the other big consultancies. H I can remember as I was the budget holder, HSC was spending, I think it was about 8,000 a day to purchase expertise, mm. which was an auction of expertise. I think the other one is you've got to look at the IMO, given that the payments into the IMO depend on the size of the fleet. And the big fleets are the flags of convenience. And so there's a lot of vested interest in making sure that life is good for them, and particularly for them with quite a lot of second hand ships, mm. rather than for the maritime nations who buy, tend to buy new ships. And the oil of ages who do the same, but they have to do this. So there's a lot of compromise, even in the international bodies, about. What's on the agenda and what isn't. And double bottoms were not with the same bit of iron as in that gas. One was safety, right? Yes. The other was environment. And those two bits don't talk to each other very well. Could we return to safety measures and legalities uh, and just follow up Joshua Down's question? He's, uh, he's got Gordon Lightfoot going through his mind, the record of him, Fitzgerald, and he's wondering, we've seen the um, the memorial service. He's wondering if there's been other kind of um, you know, popular representations of this, or commemorations of this, and you know, outside of the courts, how has it been remembered? So that was the question. I think that's hmm. yeah. there. There's Somebody some... just push the green button for um, you cue the green the green button on the side of you to your right. Yeah, you just push that. Yeah. Thank you. That there's certainly been commemorations, I think, every 10 years in mm. Ireland. I expect there are in France. The uh, French Irish Association of the Relatives and Friends of the Battleships does various things. Um, what else has there been? But, and certainly local things as well. I, you know, I couldn't tell you what they were, but skimming through the um, Hawk newspapers and so on. I certainly found references to events commemorating it. 
because the people on the shore were very affected too, mm -hmm. not just those who lost people. If you listen to Choir in the Sky, and I'm very lovely to send the, um, send the links, so you can get that for free, it's a radio program, listening to the eyewitnesses, you know, many of them were really shocked, traumatized, because there was this delay. Um, it was people on the, and I'll, I'll say this because I didn't, I was a bit reluctant to put it into a formal presentation. Um, a lot of the criticism of God and of the absence of the controller at the time of the accident. And he said he was there, and the evidence was that he wasn't, and it delayed the emergency response. And it, again, if anyone wants to follow it up, all 508 pages are available in a PDF. <laughs> Concentrate. Which I can, which you can download or I can supply if you wish. <laughs> I didn't read it when you wish. But nothing in song. That I think is a specific, specific um, question. But maybe, maybe, maybe okay. there, maybe there ought to be. Was she more brought out of the song? I think. You, you think so? There, there is one. He did. Yeah. He did. All right. Okay. So there is. Uh, this is when the bio was like open. Yeah. Mm. And I believe God has reopened the terminal in Turtle. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, Sorry about the disruptions there with the with the catering people, but when, no, no, not you. Not, not apologize. You, you can do that yourself. No, no, the early earlier ones. They came back to steal our wine glasses, and I had to tell them that those <laughs> those wine glasses don't belong to them. So I don't know. I'm, I'm about to get reported to the college hierarchy, but yes, I had to keep them away uh, from our wine glasses. But they're there for us and uh, specifically for you. And it might be you'd be a good time to partake if uh, we're all agreed. And if you are, then then that's may, uh, I, may I do yes. a small commercial? Yes, please do. Just to say that um, thank you all very much for your questions. And may I invite anyone who's interested to come to the History Fellows at the Society of Apothecaries. We're very glad to welcome a guest or two. Excellent. And uh, Louise Sanger and uh, Barbara Jones are saying their hellos uh, from the uh, from the from the ether. Very good. Yes, the apothecary is there. Uh, they have to recommend it. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bringing the bringing the whole seminar to where it should be on shipping and the
Are you Wait, 